My text this morning is in John chapter 6, the first 15 verses. You've heard it once during the worship time, scripture reading. I would like for you to hear it again. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing. <laughs> it comes as we hear. And of course, you could read along, you know, with your Bible, and we put it up on the screens. But this time, I think maybe I'm going to ask you not to do that. To not so much rely upon the eye gate, but rely upon the ear gate. You have your Bibles. You can read them as often as you like. But it's not all the time that you can have someone read the Scripture to you. And you can have Scripture come to you by way of the ear gate. And it gets into your spirit maybe in a different way. It finds a new way into your soul. And so maybe close your eyes unless you're prone to go to sleep in church, in which case I would advise you to keep your eyes open. But I I want you to just sort of disappear into the text. I want you to be there. I want you to be among the multitude. I want you to allow images to come up in your imagination. Uh, Don't just hear this at an objective difference, distance, but subjectively fall into the story. Be there. Just listen, hear, let your imagination go free. The Holy Spirit will help you with this. Listen carefully. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover... The feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that had been done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Amen. John's gospel contains seven signs strategically placed to direct our faith toward Jesus. These are seven miracles, but John doesn't call them miracles. He always calls them signs. A sign is not important in and of itself. A sign is important because it points us toward something. John says that these signs are given that it might point our faith toward Jesus. And as we have a right kind of faith in Jesus, John says we will have life in his name. That what John wants to engender in us through these signs is a right approach to Jesus that would result in us living the kind of life that God intends. Now, so far we have seen three of the seven signs. First was the water turned to wine at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. It's a sign. And what does the sign point to? It points to this, that the kingdom of God is moving away from purity codes and moving toward table fellowship. That the kingdom of God is going to now be less like performing purity rituals under the watchful gaze of religious gatekeepers and more like sharing food and drink with close friends at a shared table. The second sign is the healing of the royal official's son there in Cana. 
And what does the sign point to? It points to the fact that Jesus is the word of God sent to heal us. Psalm 107, 20 says he sent his word and healed them. Now we have discovered that the word of God is Jesus Christ and he is sent to us to heal us. The third sign is the healing at the pool of Bethesda. And the sign points to this, that Jesus is doing the work of the Father now. When Jesus healed the man, it was the Sabbath day, and the Pharisees said, Oh, you're violating the Sabbath. You should not work on the Sabbath. Jesus said, I am working because my Father is working, and I am doing the work of my Father, and he's working now. On the Sabbath, well, it could be like this, that Jesus and the Pharisees are on different time zones. The Pharisees say it's the seventh day, the day of rest. Jesus seems to indicate that he's anticipating resurrection. He's saying it's the first day. How about this? It's the eighth day. It's the day of new beginning and new creation. And now is the time for God's work to be done. That leads us down to the fourth sign. And the fourth sign that we will look at on this Sunday is the sign in John's gospel of the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes, the feeding of the multitude. And this sign is intended to point us to Jesus as the bread of heaven. And if we pay close attention to this sign, we will see what John wants us to see, and that is the beauty of the infant. That's my sermon title for this Sunday as we look at the fourth sign in John's gospel, the beauty of the infinite. Now in John's poetic prologue to his gospel, which is so vitally important, in fact the whole of his gospel is the implications of what he gives us in that prologue, John writes, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His Beauty, that's another way of understanding the word glory. It sounds a little less religious to us. And we have seen his beauty, the beauty of a father's only son, full. Everybody say full. Full of grace and truth. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Now that's the truth set forth clearly in a poetic theological statement. But now we're going to find a sign that points us to this in a way that may help us to understand it in a better and deeper way. Now to begin with, we have to look at the problem of humanity, the problem of the human condition. And the human condition suffers from a kind of emptiness. There's just something wrong with us that can be described as a kind of emptiness. Emptiness, not only the spiritual emptiness that most of us are familiar with hearing about and are aware of and believe that Jesus Christ addresses, but also the pervasive mentality of scarcity and insufficiency. We seem to absolutely believe that there just factually is not enough to go around. That there is not enough for everybody to have all that they need. We seem to believe that. Now, why did Cain kill Abel? Was it because he thought there wasn't enough land to share? We're told that Cain rose up in the field, in the land, against Abel. Was it because... He thought that there couldn't be enough land for both Cain's crops and Abel's flocks. He had a pervasive mentality of scarcity, of insufficiency. There's not enough for me and him. And even if he's my brother, I'm going to have to deal with him. I'm going to have to do away with him. I'm going to have to eliminate the competition because I need mine. Well, we are the sons and daughters of Cain. So why do we covet? And why do we fight? And why do we exploit? Because we view the world through Cain's lens of scarcity and insufficiency. We don't perceive ourselves as blessed with abundance. We instead perceive ourselves as cursed with scarcity. And as a result, we are afraid. We could say it this way, we are raised to believe reality is zero-based and that creation is a closed system. 
We learn that very early in life. Leave that up for a moment. We are raised to believe reality is zero-based and that creation is a closed system. We know that by the time we're two or three. Even though we would know very few of those words and we wouldn't understand those phrases. And those phrases can be communicated in very sophisticated philosophical terms. But I'm telling you, by the time we are two or three years old, we have been raised to believe that reality is zero-based and that, we, that the universe is a closed system, and that there's really not enough. And so that engenders competition. And we feel like we have to be sure that we have enough, and so we have to fight, and we have to grab, and we have to get ours. And this paradigm of scarcity and insufficiency lies at the root of our systemic sins. What do I mean by systemic sins? I mean sins of the system. We tend to focus on personal sins. But I'm going to tell you something very bold. The biggest problems the world has are not personal sins, they are systemic sins. And we tend to focus on personal sins because to criticize systemic sins is very terrifying because it's to criticize the whole system. And we have to believe that there is some alternative and most people don't. But the kingdom of God is the alternative to systemic sin. We focus on personal sin because we're afraid to try to do it any other way. We fear there won't be enough oil, there won't be enough land, there won't be enough water, there won't be enough food, there won't be enough labor to go around, so we have to build and maintain our structures that guarantee that we have ours. And the whole system is sinful. No one person is responsible, no one person can change it, but we are all implicated, and it's what Jesus Christ comes to save us from. We fear there's not going to be enough for us, so we use force against them. And what we do in the process through our systemic sins is that we create an organized, slow-motion version of anarchy. You don't understand what I mean by anarchy. Anarchy is when all rule of law breaks down, when all civility is abandoned. It's what happens when you see a riot break out and law is abandoned and people are breaking shop windows and just taking and stealing what they want. People nowadays, you know, all of a sudden are talking all about the zombie apocalypse. Well, that's what we mean by that. That's anarchy. That's when the rule of law has been abandoned. Well, what we think is that we have the rule of law all the time, and then there are moments when it's abandoned, and we call it anarchy. But really, with our systemic sins, what we have done is created an organized, slow-motion version of anarchy, where throughout history, over the po- over the course of decades or centuries, the powerful are taking from the weak what they can get, and no one can seem to stop them. So Native Americans were the victims of the slow-motion, organized anarchy called Manifest Destiny. Sea law. Think about it. Now, it's into this sad world dominated by the paradigm of scarcity that the Son of God appears. Are you with me so far? We have a paradigm. We have a way of looking at the world. We have a lens that we got from Cain. And as we look out upon the world, we start when we're two years old. I mean, if you don't know this, you can, you can listen to my sermon or you can go into the nursery. And you can watch the two-year-olds fight over the toys. Because they're two years old and they're convinced that it's, the toys are scarce. Even though they're piled all around them. Hmm? They, they, don't, they don't see. We are blessed with an abundance of toys. They believe they are cursed with a scarcity of toys, and so they have to hoard them. And then tempers flare, and babies cry, and nursery workers are pushing numbers that say, come get your little Attila the Hun. (laughs) And then you just multiply it by being grown up and by armies of 10 million, and you have world history. But we learned it by fighting over toys or animal crackers, or whatever it is we're fighting over. And it's into this world that the Son of God appears on a grassy slope leading up from the Sea of Galilee where He will say, He will demonstrate, He will show with a sign that we have been deceived all along. That the world is not 
limited in a finite way that in fact there is the beauty of the infinite. So we're back in Galilee. Jesus has been to Jerusalem. He has turned, returned to Galilee. And the multitudes, they're coming in great numbers now. Thousands are coming. They're coming on those hills around the sea of Galilee. And they're gathering to Jesus, and Jesus is teaching them. And what is he teaching them? He is teaching them the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means the government of God. It means the system of God. It means the reign of God. It means the rule of God. It means the politics of God. It means the social structure of God. And it's very different than what we've known. It's not based upon a paradigm of scarcity. It's based upon the reign and rule of love. The government of God only has two laws. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The cynic will say, you can't build a society around that. Jesus says, oh, yes, you can. And it's called the kingdom of God. And I've come to announce it and proclaim it and bring it. And if you don't want it, then I'll tell my disciples to shake the dust off of their feet and move on to somebody else that wants to hear it. But know this, the kingdom of God came near unto you. That's what Jesus is doing. And the people are gathering. And we're told it's Passover. There are three Passovers mentioned in the Gospel of John. Three, you know, that's the yearly festival, the celebration of Israel's liberation from slavery in Egypt. And three of them are recorded. And it's only from John's gospel, by the way, that we get the idea that Jesus' public ministry is somewhere between two and a half and three years long. If we only had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we would probably think that Jesus' ministry was about a year long. Either case, it's a very brief public ministry. Jesus goes to one Passover publicly after his ministry begins, and then there's trouble. The second one rolls around, and Jesus this time does not go to Jerusalem for the Passover because of death threats. He, it, we're told the Judeans were seeking to kill him. They had become upset with him when he had been there for a previous festival, not Passover, but probably the festival of lights, Hanukkah. And when Jesus had said, God is my father and he is working even on the Sabbath and I am working too, they began to conspire to murder him. So Jesus avoids Jerusalem for the second Passover remains in Galilee for that Passover. And then on the third Passover, he will then go to Jerusalem, and there he will be killed. Now, Passover is a table rite. It's a Jewish table rite. It's a meal that celebrates their deliverance from their bondage in Egypt. And then God's provision for them as they make the long journey from Egypt to the promised land. Jesus now will take this Jewish table rite of Passover and in an innovative twist, he will turn it into what we call communion. By the way, the biggest difference between the Old Covenant and the New is not this. It's not, well, the Old Covenant was based upon works and the New Covenant is based upon grace. You hear people say that that's just not true. It's just not true. I mean, under the Old Covenant, they understood it was the grace of God that they had been chosen. And they understood that they were forgiven by the mercy and grace of God. The, difference, the primary difference between the Old Covenant and the New is simply this. The Old Covenant was restricted to a particular people, and the New Covenant opens it up to the whole world. And the law that then is passed away from going from the Old Covenant to the New is the laws of exclusivity. Only the circumcised, only the Jews, only the males, all of that kind of stuff. And all of that now has been set aside for the new covenant, which opens the thing up to the whole world, which, by the way, is what God had in mind all along. All right, so we're in Galilee for Passover, which is a table rite that celebrates the redemption of the people. Jesus will take that and turn it into Christian communion, and the Eucharistic theology of Jesus is found later in this very chapter because we're thinking about meals. Now... The multitudes are gathered. Jesus looks upon them, and he turns to one of his disciples, Philip, and he says, Philip, where are we to buy bread that the people may eat? Look at the people. You know, they're, they're human beings. They have needs. They need to eat. We should feed them. We should take care of that. We should meet that need. We should feed them. Where, Philip, are we to buy bread that we might feed them? And we're told that Jesus knew what he was doing. He was just testing Philip. 
And so Philip, well, he just got out, you know, his calculator, pulled out his iPhone and brought up the calculator app, and he's calculating. He says, oh, my goodness, Jesus, it's going to cost us 200 denarii. That's just, well, let me convert that for you, Jesus. That's $12,000. It's going to cost us twelve thousand. And that, and I just, that's just if everybody has like a little snack. That's not for, that's not a full meal, really. That's just for people to get a little bit, kind of put the edge, take the edge off their hunger. If, if everybody's just going to have a little, it's going to cost us twelve grand, Jesus. Jesus, well, okay, that's how you think about it. Andrew, another disciple, Peter's younger brother, he's, he pipes up and says, you know, there's a, there's a kid here. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. But no sooner does Andrew say it than he feels silly for having said it. Because he's, well, I mean, we got thousands of people. What are these five little buns and two little fish going to do? The thing is, though, he was on the right track. He started off right. I mean, he's talking about what there is. But then the paradigm of scarcity kicked in. Yeah, but there's so many. There won't be enough. There's not enough. The boy and a couple others can have some lunch, but not everybody. There's not enough. The paradigm of scarcity kicks in. And Jesus says, have the people sit down. There's a lot of green grass. Have them, have them lie down in the green pastures, will you? Just have everybody sit down. How's that psalm go? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. What's it? I shall not. What's that mean? I shall not lack. I shall not have insufficiency. I, I shall not have scarcity. I shall not not have enough. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me sit down in green pastures. Jesus is being the shepherd. And he says, have the people sit down. Little boy, will you give your lunch? I'll give, your, I'll give my lunch. And we got five loaves, little barley loaves, just little buns, little barley buns. Five little fish. Five buns and two sardines. And Jesus says, all right, disciples, you're going to be waiters today. We're going to hand out the food. And here you go, here, here you go. Go hand that out, and then go hand that out, and then go hand that out, and then go hand that out. And pretty soon you'd think we should run out, shouldn't we? Because there's what? One, two, three, four, five barter loaves, one, two fish. And, but Jesus, just, he just keeps handing it out to the disciples to go hand to the people. And it just doesn't stop. You think, well, how many? Wait, it's one, two, three, four, five barter loaves, one, two fish. But Jesus keeps, where, it, it's as if Jesus is reaching not into a finite realm of five loaves and two fish. It's as if Jesus is reaching into some other realm that is infinite. And he just keeps pulling it out, and he keeps pulling it out, and he keeps pulling it out. And by the way, this is Jesus' first hands-on miracle in the Gospel of John. Yeah, he's done miracles, but it's been by speaking a word, water turned to wine, and a little boy healed, and then a paralytic healed. But now it's a hands-on miracle. Jesus is handing out barley loaves, and he's handing out fish. And pretty soon, everybody has enough. Because Jesus has accessed the infinite. And everybody eats and eats, and they have seconds, and some have thirds. We're not naming names, but some had thirds. <laughs> but nobody minded, because there was more than enough. And they ate until people were going, no, no more. Stop. I can't eat another bite. And a couple of hours had gone by, and it was a long lunch. It wasn't an American lunch where we come driving in our cars. We don't even get out of our cars. We pull up and we're, come on, throw it. Just, I'm not even going to stop. Just throw it. What are you doing in there? Cooking it? Just give it to me. And off. I spent 90 seconds going through that window. Well, this, was, this was a Mediterranean style lunch. And no one's in a hurry. And they eat their fill. And it's beautiful. And Jesus says, well, I guess everybody, everybody had enough. We got more. Oh, Jesus, we've had enough. All right, well, then we're going we're gonna to gather up what you didn't eat. Don't want to waste anything. Nothing should be lost. 
Nothing should be lost. I like that about Jesus. Nothing should be lost. Let's gather it all up. And as I go around, they started off, now how do they start off with five? I mean, how do, you know, five, I can, I can hold five little barley loaves like that. Stick a couple of fish in my pocket. There you go. But, and then everybody's eating until they're filled. This, the math isn't working here, but the thing is, once you bring the infinite in, math goes out the window. And they gather up what's left and it's filling up 12 baskets. Of course, it would be 12. It's got to be 12. Because Jesus is reconstituting Israel, 12 tribes, 12 apostles. It's got to be 12, and it's 12 baskets full. And John says it's a sign. It's a sign. It's a sign. It's not the thing itself. When you make it the thing itself, and that's what they ended up doing, you miss the point. The crowd ended up focusing on the thing itself rather than the sign that it's pointing to. What's it? It's pointing to the kingdom of God. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. That instead of a paradigm of scarcity that causes us to have to fight and Cain has to kill Abel because there's not enough for me to have my crops and your flocks and you're in my way. And we got, instead we find out that when God is reigning and ruling him and God is in control and when we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves, in fact it turns out there is more than enough. And that scarcity was always a lie. That's the sign. The fourth sign in John's gospel tells us this. We no longer live in a zero-based closed system universe. In the incarnation, the infinite has made contact with the finite. Someone says, oh no, he just now started it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens. That's this sphere. The heavens and the earth. The above and the beneath. The infinite and the finite. We tend to think that the infinite heaven, God, is completely shut off from the finite. That's what makes the finite finite, is that it's not in contact with the infinite. And so whatever we have down here is all there is, baby. And if you want to have your toys, you better knock that other two-year-old in the head and take them because Lord knows there's not enough toys in this nursery. That's down here. But what if it's like this? In the beginning was the infinite. And the infinite was with God, and the infinite was God. And the infinite became finite and lived among us. And we beheld his beauty, the beauty of the infinite. Because what you see in this hourglass is you see that there are two spheres, upper and lower. But they are in fact connected at a single point. And that's the word made flesh. That's where God becomes man. That's where the barrier between the infinite and the finite is not only crossed, but they are connected. Is this making any sense to anybody? Now the problem with my illustration is though, is I have a finite container sphere down here, and I also have a a, a finite, but you, so you have to imagine if this container of sand here were as big as this room. Well, not as big as this room. As big as the city. Well, that didn't work. No, not as big as the city. As big as the world itself. As, as this container is as big. Not really. As, it, it, it would be more like if it was as big as the whole universe. No. Bigger than that. This is infinite. Infinite. And through Jesus Christ. Well, what's it say? And of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, grace upon grace. Of his fullness we have, see when we're down here we think, oh no, look, there's only, you know, 14 grains of sand. I got to fight for them. And by the way, the people that have the most down here are the ones that are the least likely to be aware of this up here. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
The connecting point between the infinite and the finite is called Jesus Christ. Your access to that connecting point is called faith. And when you believe on Jesus, you have accessed the connecting point between the infinite, which is so beautiful, and the finite. And once you realize that scarcity and a paradigm of scarcity, in fact, is a lie of the devil, then you can be saved from all of your ridiculous behavior down here where you're fighting for cookies with the other two-year-olds or worse once you become 42. This is why Jesus constantly tells us not to worry about scarcity. Doesn't he talk like that all the time? He's saying, come on. Why are you? Stop it. Stop it. You're, you're so worried. All the Gentiles that don't know God, they're down in here, and they don't even know that this is up here and that there is a connecting point, and that God, your Father, who loves you, is pouring of his infinite love into you. He's pouring through me into the world. And come on, look at the flowers. God will clothe you. Look at the birds. God will feed you. Don't be stuck down here. Believe that God is pouring of his infinite beauty into you. That's what Jesus preaches. Now, this, reaching this point here, faith in Jesus, um, this is where trust replaces fear and faith replaces force. This is the life, this is the life we want to live. And this is the sign the feeding of the 5,000 points to. But it's hard for us to get there. Because there's nothing that challenges us more than our sense of commitment to economic self-preservation. Because we're still convinced. We learned it when we were two years old, fighting other two-year-olds for cookies and toys. We've, we've been convinced of a paradigm of scarcity. There's not enough. There's not enough. And so... As we're dominated by the paradigm of scarcity, we believe, or I should say fear, there won't be enough. And so we're committed to maintaining economic self-preservation by force, which is the way of Cain. We say, there's only five loaves, there's only five loaves and two fish. So I get four of the loaves, because I'm an American, and both the fish, because I'm an American, and you all can have one out of my generosity. One loaf, no fish, you don't need protein, just carbs, that'll do you. And so we live that way. We're committed to maintaining economic self-preservation by force, the way of Cain. And the force maintaining our economic self-preservation is where we place our faith, what the Bible calls that idolatry. I'm going to say that one more time and then you can think about it. The force maintaining our economic self-preservation is where we place our faith, but the Bible calls that idolatry. Because this system of believing, okay, we live in a finite world, scarcity of resource, it leads to what? It leads to competition, which leads to conflict, which leads to conquest, which leads to resentment because people don't like being conquered, which leads to rebellion, which leads to retaliation, which leads to war, which leads to Scarcity being a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we have, we have competition that leads to conflict, that leads to conquest, that leads to resentment, that leads to rebellion, that leads to, leads to retaliation, that leads to war. And war is the most extravagant waste of human resources we can imagine. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of producing scarcity. It's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The white horse of conquering. On the heels of which comes the red horse of war. Why? Because people don't like being conquered. That is, they don't like other people dominating them and saying, I'm going to take four of your barley loaves, you get one. And after people get tired of that and a heroic leader rises up, then you get the red horse of war, which of course is followed by the black horse of famine and scarcity and scales that say, look, there's not enough. There's not enough because we destroyed it. 
killing one another. And then that leads to the inevitable fourth horse, the pale horse of death, which is what Jesus comes to save us from. You say, are, are you saying, Pastor Brian, that the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are about to ride? I'm saying they have ridden four or five times through every century for the past 2,000 years. They're always galloping across history. That is world history. Conquest, war, famine, death. Repeat. Conquest, war, famine, death. Repeat. Conquest, war, famine, death. Jesus comes and says, wait, stop it, stop the madness. There's another way. You don't have to be two-year-olds fighting for the toys. You don't have to fight. I know you've counted them up. One, two, three, four. There's only, there's only five. There's only five. There's only five. Only five barley loaves. One, two, there's only two fish. You don't even near enough protein. There's two fish and five barley loaves. I'm on an Atkins diet. I just got to have the two fish. I can't even eat them. And Jesus says, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Let me bless it. Baruch Hashem Adonai Eloheinu. Blessed are you, Lord God maker of the universe, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he begins to give. Because Jesus is the infinite made finite. He's the word made flesh. He's the son of God. He's the connecting point between the infinite and the finite. And Jesus just keeps pulling and pulling and then pulling. And he says, it's not five, it's infinite. It's not two, it's infinite. It's enough for everybody to have all they can eat with 12 baskets full left over of surplus. Jesus came to save us from the stupid cycle of conquest, war, famine, and death. The miracle of the loaves and fishes is the sign pointing us to Jesus and a new way. But we have to have eyes to see it. We have to have faith enough to believe it. Look what happens. John 6, verse 15. Perceiving then they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. All right, what's happening? What's happening? He's teaching the kingdom of God, the alternative society of God, the other way of living of God, the way that's not the way of Cain, the way that is not dominated by the paradigm of scarcity and insufficiency. He is teaching them the kingdom of God, and then he gives them a sign to show what it's like. He says, somebody, somebody give what you got. Right? Five loaves, two fish, all right. Sit down, sit down, sit down. You don't have to fight. Just sit down, relax, take it easy, take a load off. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Lay down in these green pastures. Baruch Hashem Adonai Eloheinu. We thank you, O God of the infinite. We thank you that you provide. And he begins to bless. And he begins to give, 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 give. And it's a sign that the kingdom of God is like that. But they misinterpret the sign. And they said, well, let's make him king. Let's come and take him by force. And Jesus says, I know what you're trying to do. See, first of all, is Jesus king? That's, that's what he came as. He is the Christ, which means Messiah, which means king. And yet when they come to make him king, he declines. In fact, he, he sneaks away off into the mountain by himself where they can't find him. Why does he withdraw from them when they're trying to make him what it is? It's because of the word force. They were going to take him by force to make him their forceful king that he could lead their forces against the others so that they could guarantee that they had enough. In other words, they wanted Jesus to ride the white horse of conquest, which leads to the red horse of war, which leads to the black horse of famine, self-fulfilling prophecy, which leads to the pale horse of death. And Jesus did not come to ride the pale horse of death. He came to bring us eternal life. And so Jesus withdraws because he isn't going to be that kind of king. He's not going to be a forceful king to lead their forces. The kingdom of Jesus is without force. The kingdom of Christ is without force. The kingdom of God is without force. The kingdom of God persuades by love, witness, spirit, reason, Rhetoric, and if need be, because we love not our lives even unto the death, martyrdom, but never by force. The kingdom of God does not come by winning the game of force down here in the sphere of the finite. The kingdom of God comes by connecting in faith to Jesus Christ to the beauty of the infinite. 
And the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ is the connecting point. The word didn't become idea. The word didn't become sermon. The word didn't become alternative social theory. The word became flesh and blood. The infinite became finite and became the connecting point. And it's through Jesus' own body and blood that God pours his pours forth into the world the infinite, but the Bible doesn't use the term infinite, the Bible uses the term eternal life. This whole time that I've been using infinite, the beauty of the infinite, I could have said eternal life, but I didn't because that kicks in your religious cliche translator. And I didn't want you to hear it as religious cliche, I wanted you to hear it in a new way. Now, the next day, Something happened that night, very spectacular, but we'll talk about that next Sunday. That's the fifth sign. The next day, the multitude comes that had been fed the day before. And this is the evidence that they didn't understand the sign. They ate the meal, but they didn't get the sign, and Jesus told them that. He says, you ate the meal, but you didn't get the sign. And they said, hey, give us some more bread. You gave us lunch yesterday, give us lunch today. More bread, more bread, more bread. We need more bread, please. And Jesus said, I'll give you something to eat. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's what I want to give you today. Change on the menu. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. What? We're kosher Jews. We're we're not cannibals. What are you out of your mind? You're crazy. And they were offended and most of them left him. Jesus says, I'm telling you, you have no life in you. I am the finite connected to the infinite. I come from the infinite Father, but I'm also among finite man. I'm the connecting point. And through my flesh and through my blood, God is pouring forth eternal life. Jesus says it just like this. Listen to how he says it. Listen, listen to how he says it. Verse, you can read the whole chapter and see it, but we'll just get the very end of it. Verse uh, 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no infinity, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has infinite life, eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day into infinite life. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds Whoever chews, whoever trogo, that's the word, whoever chews, gnaws on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living, the infinite Father sent me and I live because of the Father. See, we've got to learn, li- learn to live because of the Father, not because of the fight down here, not because we won the war down here, but we live by the Father, by our connection with the Abba. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, whoever feeds on this bread will live infinitely. Because he will have connected to the beauty of the infinite. Because this right here is Christ. That single point connecting the two spheres is the incarnation. It's the word made flesh. And we are given access to that through this table through this bread which we break and this cup which we bless gives us connection with the flesh and blood of Jesus which gives us connection with the infinite. The beauty of the infinite. The paradigm of scarcity and insufficiency is a lie of the devil. You and I have access to the infinite through Jesus Christ and through his body and blood.